Hello, and you found Why We Are Christians again. My name is Kent Philpott, and this is part two of our conversation with Susan Perlman. She's in her offices in San Francisco on Haight Street, location of Jews for Jesus, because she's a big part of Jews for Jesus. And hello again, Susan. We're it's back again. Hi, hi Kent. And uh, we, we ended the, uh, the first program with uh, your description of uh, your coming in contact with Christians and who knows who've been Arthur Bresson and Larry Norman, part of the Jesus People Movement. Um, and you had become a Christian at this point. What happened next, Susan? What happened next? I was, uh, I was uh, tw about 20 at the time. Just okay, 20 years old. And I... Um, I you know told my family about it. I told my roommates about it. I lived in uh, on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. My family lived in Brooklyn. Um, I remember my uh, mother was very upset. Felt like um, she didn't want my grandmother to know that. Is he in Judaism? You're named after um, uh, deceased relatives, and I was named after my grandmother's sister. And um, my grandmother eventually said to me, you know, I hope that God doesn't hold it against my sister that you've done what you've done. Oh my uh, God, <laughs> okay. So uh, it, was, it was not a very positive response from my family. Um, I had roommates who were um, uh, not Christians as well, and they felt like I had gone like, you know, in a weird direction that maybe I needed to see a psychiatrist or something that I would come to believe like this. Um, I was not progressive enough for them. <laughs> and so um, I really didn't get a whole lot of encouragement from the people that meant the most to me in my life at that time. But, you know, the thing about it, Kent, was that God knew that and he knew what I needed. And he was there for me when the people that I counted on were not. Okay. And I think sometimes we, you know, we let our disappointments in people kind of flavor how we look at things. But if we really can turn to the Lord and know that he is the one we need to look for, for approval from, he's the one that we need to have a smile come upon us from, not, not from other people. You know, if we can get through some of those tough times. Sure. And of course, God also put other people in my life to encourage me. Uh, even though they weren't my family, they became family to me as well. Sure. Um, now the church that um, these guys were operating out of, uh, Arthur and uh, Larry Norman, um, did you attend, start attend, attending that church? I did. Um, it was a church that was uh, actually pastored by a guy named Paul Moore, who was uh, a Nazarene pastor from okay. New Jersey. The Nazarene church? That's right, the Nazarene church. And um, he, um, he, there were people in that church that, you know, were f very friendly to me. I would come and, um, because it was in New Jersey and I lived in New York City, I would come on Saturday, stay over on Saturday night in the missionary housing that the church provided. Wow. And, and then um, help with kind of some of the um, uh, maintenance work in the church uh, to kind of pay for my free housing <laughs> and and attended the services on Sunday and then I met people in the church as well who you know just reached out to me and were very friendly and and warm and uh, I stayed there for a while I eventually needed to find a church in Manhattan because that was really not very convenient sure and so um, uh, I was uh, looking for a church where there was a, a you know a real sense of activism because remember i was an activist i was a an anti-war activist now i was an activist for jesus and <laughs> i needed i needed to find people who had that same kind of idea i remember as a new believer i went to the new york bible society and the american track society to get literature so that i could hand it out on the street I, nobody told me i had to do that i just like how could i not if i believe this not share it with others yeah. and so um I was out one day and I saw these other people handing stuff out and uh, actually they were African-American and I went up to them and, and told them that I was a believer in Jesus too. And uh, they invited me to their church in Queens, New York. 
and uh, I I went went that following Sunday, and um, and was very well uh, received and accepted in the church, and um, I figured I I should do everything I can you know to support this place because they love Jesus and they're showing Jesus to others. Um, I joined the choir even though I really couldn't sing very well. Um, I went to the Wednesday evening prayer meeting and, you know, and I was, I was like this very, you know, uh, active member uh, of this, this church and, and it was a place where I initially grew in, in the Lord. Now, I, I forgot to ask you, uh, were you baptized? I was, I was, in a swimming pool. In a swimming pool, okay. Yes. Up in Rochester, New York. Okay, do you remember who baptized you? Um, it was an itinerant um, preacher, but he baptized me and gave me a Bible. When, don't you wish you had a photograph of that, Susan? Oh, I do. I do. <laughs> oh, I know. Me too. Me too. But it was a genuine baptism. And sure. um, I, I remember my great uncle um, had said to me when I became a believer, the, one of the first questions he asked me was, was I baptized? And I and if, I said, no. And he says, well, please wait, don't, don't do that because that's like sort of the final thing. And once you do that, there's like a point of no return. And he wanted me to go to Israel and study with a rabbi before I got baptized. And I, I didn't do that. I didn't go to Israel. And he was, he was very sad about that. I see. Well, your early days as a Christian spent there in, in New York City, Manhattan, and so on. Right. Follow, bring us a little more history. Okay. Uh, following well, that, Susan. Right. Now, the Ju Jews for Jesus movement was having its um, heyday in, in the Bay Area of San Francisco. And um, Moish Rosen, the founder, was uh, living up in Marin County, where you, where you are. And uh, uh, he had done a lot of uh, recruiting of young missionaries to the Jewish people in New York and asked one of those missionaries to be on the lookout for some spark plugs uh, because he wanted to recruit some people to come this, to San Francisco. Okay. And, uh, and so this uh, former staffer of his uh, in New York met me um, and, uh, and we started talking about things and she wrote to Moish and said, um, you know, I met this girl, Susan Perlman, you got to get her out there in San Francisco. Who, who was this woman? Do you remember? Her name uh, was Miriam, Miriam Slichter, later became Miriam Nadler. She was the first leader of our You're leader. kidding me. I know Miriam and I know Sam. Right. Miriam, oh, you're right. Now she was a spark plug. Yeah. She was, so, she was, she was something else. Oh yeah. Right. So I, I, uh, um, Moise, Moise told her to have me write to him. Uh, to share my story of faith. So, and then I never heard back from him. And she brought it up to me a few weeks later. And I said, well, he never wrote back. And she said, well, that's not like Moish. And so she actually called him and he told her that at that time, Jews for Jesus was uh, based in Corte Madera. Uh -huh. and, right, and, and for some reason there had been somebody at the post office in Corte Madera that had been, um, stealing some of the Jews for Jesus mail. The person had eventually got caught, but I think among the pieces that were stolen was my letter yes. to wife. And so he said, no, I never received it. Have her call me. And, uh, and so again, I thought this was kind of gutsy of this stranger to ask me to do this, but I, I called him and I remember the conversation. I said, um, um, my name is Susan Perlman. And um, my friend Miriam asked me to call you, but this is an expensive call. You know, back then, actually, you paid a lot for long distance calls like that. Oh, yes, you did. Yes, we did. From yeah. New York to, to uh, San Francisco. I said, so I can only talk for three minutes. So Moore said to me, give me your phone number. And when three minutes are up, I'll call you back. And <laughs> <laughs> which he did. And, uh, and in the course of this conversation where we were, quote, getting to know each other, he asked me a very pivotal question. He says, how do you see yourself spending the rest of your life in terms of serving God? Well, I was busy writing um, copy for JC JCPenney uh, bedspreads and things like that. And, uh, and yet I also on my, on my own time, like I said, I would 
go out and hand out tracks and do stuff that I thought would count for something beyond that. And I said, well, I don't know. I do the best I can. Um, I share my faith wherever I can. And he said, no, I want you to dream, dream a little. If you could do anything, what would you like to do? And I said, well, I write for a living. I would love to write things that would honor and glorify God. And I was directing a, a children's theater group in New York that used to do weekend block parties. I said, I have a little drama experience. I would love to do street drama that told people about Jesus. And Moish paused for a second. He said, well, you know, you could do both those things with us out here in California. <laughs> That's because, <laughs> because I can't offer you a job because he didn't have a job to offer me. He says, but I can offer you um, the opportunity to do these things. And if I have food on my table, you'll have food on your table. And if I have a roof over my head, you'll have a roof over your head. When can you come? <laughs> so that was the benefit package. And, uh, uh, and I, I didn't hesitate. I, I couldn't believe the words out of my own mouth. I said, well, I need to give my job two weeks notice. And he says, okay, I'll see you in two weeks. And he hung up the telephone. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and I thought, what did I just do? <laughs> <laughs> so that started an amazing journey that's uh, lasted these uh, many, many decades. Yeah, uh, many decades, Susan. Yeah, okay. So you got here. Uh, you know, I remember you back then. I remember you. Uh, we didn't, we, I don't know if we ever had a real close conversation, but I knew about you. Okay. And uh, I probably saw you at different, different venues and et cetera, uh, and so on. So you got out here about what year? I got out in 1972. 72, yes. The Jesus Movement is still is still underway. We're just starting Church of the Open Door in San Rafael. What, what were you first doing at Jews for Jesus when you got here? Well, um, because I had written for a living and because I had told Moish the things I wanted to do, he allowed me to do that. First, actually, he actually had a job that opened up once I got here. It was his, as his secretary. And so he offered me this paid job. And I said, no, I didn't move clear across country to be stuck behind this electric typewriter. I remember that's what we had back in those days. Yes. I said, uh, I said, you said I could write and I could do drama and that's what I'll do. And I got a part-time job in a local restaurant to pay my bills and I was a full-time volunteer. Okay. So I wrote, uh, I, I wrote press releases, I wrote tracks, I did all kinds of things like that. And I became part of the startings of what was called the New Jerusalem Players. It was a drama team yes. that, that uh, went around and did street drama um, on, at uh, Sproul Plaza in Berkeley and at, yeah. at San Francisco State and at the College of Marin. Yes. And liber I remember Liberated Wailing Wall from that day. That was our music group, and I was not good enough for the music group, so I no, was no. around the group. <laughs> uh, Susan, did you know my oldest daughter, Dory, who worked for Moish? Of course I did. Yes, okay. Of course I did. Um, and uh, she, uh, she, was, uh, she was just a, a real bright light in the office. Yes, and she was. She is. Wow. And she's still following Jesus, too. But she knew Moish because Moish was always coming over to our house. Yeah, yeah. That <laughs> was at that, at that period of time. It was great so now, move us from where you were there to what's going on now, Susan. Okay. When we started out, uh, Ken, uh, the name Jews for Jesus wasn't even well known. And so we did a lot of high profile things to uh, get Jewish people to recognize that there are Jews who believe in Jesus, that they that we could still remain Jewish in terms of our heritage and our expression of our faith, uh, but be fully followers of Jesus at the same time. And after an, a number of years, that became known. I, I, we didn't have to prove that anymore. I, I don't think there's a Jew in the United States today that doesn't know that there are Jews who believe in Jesus. Yeah. And, and what we did back then uh, a lot of the high profile things involved being on the streets, handing out uh, gospel literature, which we call broadsides. Broadsides. Um, 
doing uh, our music teams and our drama teams on the street. Now the street corners were our place of engagement with the Jewish community. Cause like I said, they weren't interested in walking into a church building or a Christian bookstore, but we could get uh, Jewish people to interact with us on the street. Well, things have changed a lot. And the street corner of today is the internet. Yes. That, that's the marketplace of ideas for people. Um, and so um, we do quite a bit uh, of online evangelism in Jews for Jesus. We yeah. have a 24 seven live chat that's available. And because uh, chat online uh, can be anonymous, a lot of Jewish people gravitate toward that because they don't have to identify themselves initially. But we move from being anonymous with people in a chat room to getting their phone number, to getting to talk to them, to getting to meet them face to face. And that has been really uh, exciting. Yeah. Um, another area for us has been um, uh, doing a whole lot more uh, with, with regard to making in, uh, environments uh, open and friendly to Jewish people. Uh, so um, we have three different phases of our ministry. The first is go and tell, and that's kind of our proclamation ministry. Um, call that go and tell. Go and tell. Go and tell. Uh, so like uh, on a college campus, we might have a table uh, with um, uh, a big um, cold brew co coffee, um, that thing, and, and we'll have trays of a bruise for Jesus that we hand out to the students and engage in conversations, or we have uh, message boards that we put up um, so people can use those stickies to pray for things and, or to make a statement about something. And then we have the engagement with them that way. That's more go and tell. Then we have what we call come and see. Um, and come and see involves uh, opportunities for people to come and experience Jesus in a very uh, friendly and cool setting. So for instance, in Los Angeles, we have uh, right across from UCLA, something called the Upside Down Cafe. Oh. And it is a cafe with like really, really good coffee um, and internet and an art gallery. And people come in and they can have a great cup of coffee. It's donation based, so they, we don't charge for it. But believe it or not, um, donation based uh, facility like that actually pays for itself. Oh. People love the coffee so much that they'll, they're still not paying what they'd pay in Starbucks, but sure. they're giving, you know, they're giving something for what they're getting for free. And you call that the name of the cafe again is? Upside Down Cafe. No, oh, and we took that down. from, yeah. The, the, it's kind of a play on words. N not only does the gospel, the upside down in terms of dealing with the gospel, turning the world upside down, but in Israel, uh, there's a coffee called Cafe Afouk, which is like a upside down coffee. And so people know that. Okay. Um, wow. Well, I, okay. Maybe, maybe somebody going to see this program and go to the upside down cafe by UCLA. Yeah, so I mean, our baristas are all believers that can engage with people in conversation who want to engage and, um, and just it's, it's a very, you know, low key, but um, very obvious and they go and they see the upside down cafe, they also see a little plaque on our building that says Jews for Jesus. So they know. So they, so they know, yeah. They know. There's nothing, yeah, there's no subterfuge there at all. Okay. Um, and then we have different opportunities in terms of come and see uh, by way of art shows. In uh, Tel Aviv, we have what we call the Rosen Center, named after Moish Rosen. In, and it is a very cool setting where we have um, art shows and uh, uh, there's also a little um, you know, coffee bar in there, but people can come and view the artwork, the photography, you know, we'll have a, um, you know, a food truck when we have one of those shows uh, showing the, uh, you know, have with food from India and that kind of thing. Um, we, we have this in Europe as well, this, and a, a one in New York next to NYU. Really? So, yeah. What a location. Yeah, and then uh, the, the third 
aspect of the ministry we call love and serve. Say and that again. Love and serve. So go and tell, come and see, and then love and serve. And love and serve is our ministry out to the community um, uh, in helps ways uh, where the gospel is also uh, presented. So we will go out on the streets, we'll talk with, um, you know, Israelis just like every other people group have the ills of society upon them and particularly in the big cities like Jerusalem and Tel Aviv. We have homeless, we have drug addicts, we have uh, street traffic people and so on. And so we, we go out, we engage with them, uh, we share the love of Jesus, we offer them uh, help, get them into rehab programs, feed them, um, just love on them and do so with a message of Jesus. You know, because we'll always be asked, well, why are you doing this? And we'll say, well, this is what our rabbi has taught us to do. Oh, oh really? <laughs> who's your rabbi? And I will say, our rabbi is Jesus. And then share from the, the scriptures about what Jesus has taught about caring for one another. Wow, wonderful. Um, uh, one of the things we just started, by the way, uh, Kent, is a food truck in Tel Aviv. It's the first Christian food truck in the country of Israel. Wow. We bought it, uh, outfitted it, and it became operational just as in these past few weeks. Really? Yes. Wow. So, now you've been to Israel a few times, I imagine, Susan? Oh, yes. yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, one of the things we do in Israel we're not doing right now because of COVID is we bring sh uh, teams uh, short term to Israel from churches all over the world so that they can take part in a lot of these different ministries. It's, it's a great opportunity because I think lots of Christians, when they think of Israel, they think of it as kind of a Christian Disneyland. You know, it's a place to go and see the sites that Jesus, places Jesus walked and the places they can find in the Bible. But it is a living, living country with people who are really needing the message of life that only Jesus can bring. That's Less than one half of 1% 1 of Israelis know Jesus. One half of 1%. Yes. In my mind, that's the reason to be there. Absolutely. Yeah. And we have our largest work in, in Israel. We have over 40 full-time missionaries there. Yes. Well, that's wonderful. Jews for Jesus has just kept going. Uh, even after Moshe's death, how long ago did he die, Susan? I'll never forget Moshe. I remember he telling me that I needed to go and be a seminary professor. That's what he thought I should be, a seminary professor. And we'd argue about that. <laughs> so Susan, we're, we're almost at the end of our program. And I'm going to ask a fellow Jewish believer, my wife, Kate, Katie. <laughs> now we're, we're, <laughs> we're a little bit different in our broadcast stuff here. We... I hope I hope she didn't go out in the back. You know, here she is. Here she is. Here's Katie. Come on, Katie. <laughs> we just got a few minutes here. Oh, are we still on? Okay. We're still. Oh yeah, we're still on. Yeah, here she is. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah. You wonder if I you mean, got your hair combed right? Oh, you know, Zoom. Zoom is a mirror. Is annoying. <laughs> <laughs> so we've we've had a we've had a great time with Susan, and again she's. The Jews for Jesus, and when I think of Jews for Jesus, I think of Susan Perlman. Yes, indeed. <laughs> yeah, that's what uh... I think of. I always do. Um, okay, your favorite book in the Hebrew Bible, Susan, what would that be? It would be the book of Psalms. Okay, Psalms? I, I, I can find something in Psalms to be encouraged by, to be... Um, uh, convicted by to, <laughs> yeah. uh, move, move forward in, uh, yeah. in all those areas um, and and to be consoled in as well you know yeah. and I think right now it's a period of time where people need comfort um, in this isolation that they're feeling and I think the book of Psalms is a great place for that. I'm uh, preaching on Isaiah 12 this next Sunday and it is yeah. a psalm it's a psalm Isaiah 12 
It's it is, and, and that's actually my favorite verses of the Bible are in Isaiah 12. Really? <laughs> yes. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and yes. will not be afraid for the Lord my God is my strength and my song, and he's also yes. become my salvation. And there's a wonderful song we sang in the Jews for Jesus Singers. I'm sure the Liberated Wailing Wall way for a long time. Hine El Yeshua T. Yes. yes. Yeah. So, well, okay, that's wonderful. I, uh, Isaiah ends that, that chapter with the, the phrase, his favorite phrase for God, the Holy One of Israel. The Holy One of Israel. Yes. Huh. Yes, he does. Well, I'd love oh. to hear that sermon, uh, Kent. Is it, is it uh, streamed online? Well, yeah, we'll, uh, uh, we, we stream it. It's on Vimeo in a couple days. It will be made podcast of. And At our uh, website, uh, MillerAvenueChurch.org, we have um, links by no later than Wednesdays. We will have the recorded service, the whole service, and right. you can find the sermon in in that service <laughs> okay now susan moving to the greek bible do you have a favorite uh uh book there uh the book of romans the book oh, of yes. romans the <laughs> hardest book the, yes the hardest the of theological all books. deepest and, and and i particularly like chapters 9 10 and 11 oh yes okay. the ones that are often skipped in the um in the commentaries of the book of Romans because they so pointedly speak to the Jewish people. Yes, okay. <laughs> yes, and, and um, I, I did a paper for uh, one of my Greek exegesis classes on, uh, um, uh, and then all Israel will be saved. And what does that really mean? Oh, big deal. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, one, one thing that I found out about being a Christian is, there's no two of us that are exactly alike. No differences. Okay, now, Susan, we just got time for your favorite Bible verse. Okay. Did, you have, did you made, not, a lot of people don't have one favorite one. No, but one that really does speak to me a lot is from Romans chapter 10, uh, verse 1. Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. There you go. That's okay. That's a beauty. With, with uh, the Apostle Paul, I share that prayer. Yes. Yeah, that's right. Wow. Well, Susan, thank you so much. Um, this has been, I just loved it. I, I like to go more, but <laughs> here we are. We, we've done two good programs and uh, I appreciate you. We love Jews for Jesus and may the Lord bless your ministry. Well, thank you, and um, come visit us at JewsForJesus.org online. Yes. Okay, we will. Of course. All right. You, we've reached the end of Why We Are Christians. Be looking for uh, the more programming coming up. So long.